Well, it's uh, great to be with you, although I can't see you very well, with, but uh, I'm excited to bring you chapel messages today and, and on Wednesday. I, I love to speak to young people. Someone asked me once, what's my favorite thing to do in life? And I said, doing chapels. So here we are. Turn with me to Matthew 15. As, as we turn there, let me, uh, I was asked to say just a word or two about what we, what we do. Uh, I am president of Pure Training Forum Seminary. We have 265 students. Half of them are from overseas. And we train them and send them back to their various countries. They become seminary presidents, theological teachers, pastors, missionaries, church planners. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful work. We also um, are very much involved in, in Reformation Heritage books. I began that ministry same time I began the seminary 29 years ago. And um, if you are a good writer and you want to write really good books for young people or for everyone, um, feel free to contact me. I'd love to uh, see a manuscript or two from those of you who are aspiring writers. I'm married with uh, three children. And six years ago, I had no grandchildren. Today, I have 10. In fact, my wife is always with me um, for the last five years since we've become empty nesters. But uh, this is the first time I'm without her in five years because one of our daughters just had a baby. She lives in Alberta and Canada. And so my wife is there at the moment. So thank you for your witness. Thank you for this university. It's well known all around the country and the world. And you young people, you are greatly, greatly blessed to be here. I pray that God will work richly in all of your lives and mature your faith as you grow in years. May you grow in grace and grow in knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I wanted to speak to you about how Christ matures our faith. And no matter how old we are or no matter what we've experienced in life, we always want to know him better. That's a fundamental mark of grace. Isn't that true? If you love Christ, you want to know him better. And so we need to be matured our entire lifetime in, in, the, in the doctrines and in the person of Christ and in God's amazing grace. And I want to show you how Christ does that from a vignette that we read in Matthew 15. Matthew 15 Verses 21 through 28. Hear the word of God. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not fit to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great, or you could translate it, mature is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Let's pray. Great God of heaven, I pray that this chapel may be used by thee to mature the faith of those students who know thee and love thee and seek thy face, and that it may also stir up jealousy among those who may not yet be saved, that they may seek this glorious Christ who knows how to work in us to make us fall in love with him and fall out of love with ourselves and help us to trust in him alone for salvation and to grow in that trust and to cling to thee, Lord Jesus, in every situation as we've just been singing together. So bless us now and use this chapel for our spiritual gain. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, if I were to ask you, what kind of Christian do you want to be? What would you say? What kind of maturity do you want to have? A scale of one to 10, how solid do you want to be? That's actually a question I often ask couples who come to me for marital counseling, and then I say to them, well, how, how good do you want to have your marriage restored? Do you, do you want to get, reach a 10? Do you want to stop at seven? And, and they all say, no, we, we want to be a 10 marriage. A true Christian wants to live holy and solely for Christ. You want to be mature, you want to be robust, you want to live by faith and not by sight. You can't be a true Christian and settle for mediocrity, can you? When you've got such a glorious Savior to serve. And so, Jesus is the one who not only begins the work of salvation in us, but he grows it and matures it, and he often does that through trial. Trial is actually a blessing for us. I mean, where would you be if you never had any trials in your life? Probably be a spoiled brat, as would I. But God sends us trials, then works through those trials, through his word, through preaching, through fellowship, through all the spiritual disciplines to grow us and mature us in his holy faith. And so it's important to want to grow. It's important to be able to say with Paul, I count myself not to have arrived, but I want to grow in knowing Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. And so in this story, which is often mysterious for people, like why would Jesus seem to rebuff this woman three times in a row? You need to understand that at the end of these kinds of stories, Jesus often hints at the real meaning, the real purpose of his encounter with someone at the very last, at the very last verse usually. And so you see it here, O woman, mature is thy faith. He's matured her, even in the process of this amazing dialogue. And so my theme this morning is how Christ matures our faith. I want to look at it in three thoughts, by his apparent silence, by his apparent rejection, and by his apparent insult. How Christ matures our faith through silence, rejection, and even insult. So consider this Canaanitish woman. She comes from outside of the boundaries of Israel. She really has no rights to the Jewish Messiah, but she has a daughter that is grievously vexed with the devil. She's tried various physicians, no doubt, in her own area. No one can help her daughter. And so she decides she's heard about Jesus. She's heard about how he causes the deaf to hear and the blind to see. And she thinks, perhaps I can have access to him. Perhaps he can do something no one else can do for my daughter. Heal her. Perhaps he can be Jehovah Rophi, the Lord who heals. And so she, no doubt, talks to her neighbors about her plans, and probably the neighbors say to her, you know, what are you doing going to the Jewish Messiah? He won't hear you. He, he, he'll, he, he's, he's in Israel. In those days, you know, gods and saviors were confined to their own locales, and you just didn't worship another god in another area or go to another savior. But this woman is driven in her soul's need. She hears that Jesus is not just a man. She hears that he's the Lord of lords, that he's the almighty king of kings. And so she comes to him. And amazingly, sovereignly, Jesus just at that moment is on the northern boundary of Israel. She comes down from the north and she's going to look for him and God brings her right to him. And she cries out when she sees him, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. And in the Greek here, it's given in the repetitive sense. That is to say, she, the streets rang with her noise. She cried over and over and over again. You'd think that Jesus would answer her right away when you consider who she was, where she came from, who she was seeking, why she was seeking him. 
and the urgency of her coming and the desperateness of her case, surely Jesus will answer her right away. And then you read these amazing words. But, the first of three buts, three rejections, so it seems. But he answered her, not one word. A crying woman and a silent Jesus. What cause for doubt? Before the woman left home, these people said he won't hear you, no doubt. And, and now he doesn't seem to hear. You think this woman would turn around and, and go home right away, don't you? It's no use seeking Jesus. This was a failed mission. She's crying. She's crying. And he, he walks on as if, as if she's not even there. But you see, she can't turn her back on Jesus. It's impossible. True faith never turns its back on Jesus Christ. When you have true faith, you can't live without Jesus. I hope you know something of that personally in your own soul. True faith perseveres. Jesus Christ is the object, the sole object of true faith. Faith can't rest until it lays hold of him, until he hears the cry of faith. Even his silence will not send this woman away. But what about you this morning? Maybe, maybe you're really crying hard to God for something right now. Maybe you have a burden in your life and you're praying every day. And maybe it's for your own soul. Maybe it's for some providential trial. And you feel like God's not hearing you. You've been there? The silence of God can be deafening in the life of a believer. A life of a believer is someone who both knows the presence of God and knows the sorrow of missing God. God is not always at our beck and call just like that. We always feel communion with him. If you're a Christian, you know what it means to have the burden of silence. The Scots, Scottish uh, theologian Samuel Rutherford once said this, the silence of Jesus Christ is the bitterest ingredient that the Christian has to drink in his cup of sorrow. In fact, he even said, it's a taste of hell on earth for the believer. The burden of silence. Where is thy God? The scoffers sneer. And you find this all over the Bible. Song of Solomon, the bride looking for the bridegroom. I will arise and go about the city and the streets and in the broad ways. I'll seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but I found him not. I called him, but I got no answer. Or Jeremiah in Lamentations 3, when I cry and shout, the Lord shuts out my prayer. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud that my prayer should not pass through. Martin Luther knew that struggle. You know, it's one thing to treat Martin Luther like a hero that in some ways he is for initiating the Reformation, but carrying out the Reformation was another thing. One day he said to his wife, Katie, Katie, I'm, God is so silent to me, I'm afraid God is dead. And he just left house that day after he said that and he came home that night and all the shades were drawn, which at that time meant that someone had died and he, he rushed through the door. He said, Katie, who died today? Well, she said, this morning, you said, God. And that, that broke him. That broke him. He realized the error of his ways. But to have the silence of God in your life when you're crying out to him is a, a deepening experience. You cling to him, and he seems to give you no answer. And we don't know, we don't know all the reasons why God will be silent to his people at times. But one thing we know, well, two things we know. First, we know that God knows a lot more than we do. Our lives are like a thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle. And we may know only two or three pieces, able to work with two or three pieces at a time. But God looks at the whole picture. God sees all the thousands of things that will, are going on and will go on in your life. He knows how to fit them all together into a perfect jigsaw puzzle where every piece fits into the next piece. He knows exactly when to give you silence. He knows exactly when to speak to you. He knows exactly how to handle you. 
But why? Why would he ever be silent? Well, probably for a lot more reasons than I can tell you, but I can tell you two reasons why he's often silent to us. The first is for his own greater glory. If you read John 11, you remember the story about Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. Lazarus is sick unto death, the Bible says. And it says Jesus loved him. And then it says this amazing statement. Now, when Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick and dying, he stayed where he was for two more days. And he was only six miles away. I'll tell you, if I got a, if I got a phone call right now that my wife in Alberta was sick and dying, I'd interrupt this chapter, chapel, I'd get on the plane, I'd go to see her right away. Because I love her. And Jesus loved Lazarus. And he stayed where he was. Why? Oh, verse 4 says why. Verse 4 says, he did it for the glory of God. You see, how does God get more glory? By, by healing a sick Lazarus or by raising a dead Lazarus? And how does God get more glory in your life by sometimes allowing you to keep on crying out to him and giving you no answer so that the flames of your hope are just about quenched and they turn to just bare coals and they're cut off and you think there's no hope? Maybe you even give up praying for something and then out of the ashes of your forlorn hope, he fans the flame and gives you an answer above and beyond what you could ever expect so that you cry out, this is a God answer. This is a God thing. Only God could do this. And you give him all the glory. And you become nothing. And he becomes everything. That increases your faith. So that's one reason God often delays. Remember, his delays are not his denials. He often delays to get more glory for himself. And then, secondly... The second piece I want to mention to you of this jigsaw puzzle is to mature, to refine, to purify your faith. You know, when I was nine years old, I, I took a trip with my dad, just he and I alone. So it was very special to me because I had brothers and sisters and had very little time alone with my dad. And we, we, we drove from Grand Rapids or Kalamazoo, Michigan, rather, to Hoboken, New Jersey, to pick up my grandfather, who was coming over the ocean on the boat. And as we went through Pennsylvania, you know, you know all those tunnels, or maybe you don't know, uh, you're in the West. The Appalachian Tunnels, there's, there's, there's long tunnels through the mountain, like miles. And uh, we got into what, the first tunnel, I'd never been in a tunnel in a life, my life like that. And I, I started feeling a little claustrophobia, and I said to my dad, is this tunnel ever going to end? He goes, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He said, you're going to see a pinprick of light at the end of the tunnel quite soon. And then the light's going to expand and expand as we get closer, and then we're going to break out in the sunshine, and you'll appreciate the sunshine more than ever before. And that's exactly what happened. But 10 minutes later, we were in another tunnel, and then another Seven or eight of them. And, you know, the Christian life is kind of like that. John Bunyan said, when one trial does me leave, another trial does me seize. God brings us from tunnel to tunnel and back into the sunshine of his grace. And we often learn more how to have our faith matured. We learn more how to walk by faith in the dark tunnel than we do walking by sight in the sunshine of his mercy. And you see, that's exactly what God wants to do with you. He gets more glory when you give him all the glory while you're in the tunnel and don't have the answers, but trust him by faith. He gives you the tunnel so that you look to Jesus and not to the waves and sink like Peter. He matures you. He matures you even through his silences. Now, Jesus also brings this woman into a second trial. Rejection. Rejection. So it seems. The disciples turn to Jesus and say, send her away, for she cries after us. 
What in the world are they doing that for? I thought they were supposed to be evangelists. Well, Jesus and the disciples had just about been captured in Jerusalem. They escaped Jerusalem. They came to the northern border of Israel. So they wouldn't tr attract so much attention. And now this woman is, woman is filling the streets with her cries. And the disciples are saying, get rid of this woman, Jesus, because if you don't, we're going to be in the same trouble we were in in Jerusalem. And you're, you're going to be betrayed and, and uh, imprisoned and send her away, for she cries after us. Well, it wasn't easy for this woman, no doubt, to be rejected by all Jesus' disciples. But we do understand it a little bit. The disciples are also sinners. And uh, they were a little high-minded sometimes. She, she's, they said she cries after us. She wasn't crying after them. She was crying after Jesus. And they're too proud here. And they're, they're too uncaring. And we see their sinful side. But then Jesus, and that's the astonishing thing. Jesus says, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So now he finally speaks, and he basically says, I'm sent to the, to the sheep of Israel. And she's not a sheep. She's not of the house of Israel. She is lost. She's got that one qualification. But it's as if he's saying to her, my grace is not for you. What a rejection. What a trial. Certainly now, certainly now, she's going to go home, don't you think? She's going to just say, well, I tried him and he won't have me, so um, I'm returning home. No, no, no. Faith never turns its back on Jesus. So why would Jesus say that? Well, there's some truth in what he says, you see, because in his earthly ministry, he really was sent to the Jewish people. It wasn't until he died. I mean, he, he reached out to a few Gentiles, but it wasn't until he died, rose again, ascended into heaven, poured out his Holy Spirit, that the gospel spread through all the, all, to all the Gentiles and all, all the nations of the earth. So John Calvin says of this text, it was as if he was saying to her, why are you trying to raid the table of my Jewish brethren, taking the bread from them before it's my time to, to pour myself out among the Gentiles? You see, he was sent as a prophet, especially to the Jews, and only later did he become the high priest to to people all over the face of the earth. And so this woman hears this. And what does she do now? And this is amazing. If you look at verse 25, she responds to Jesus by coming and worshiping him and saying, Lord, help me. I mean, this is phenomenal. This is phenomenal. Instead of going away, and saying, he won't have me, she perseveres. Her faith grows the more, even as her prayer grows smaller. Do you notice that? You notice there's nothing about her daughter in this prayer. It's interesting, isn't it? She first comes with, a, let's say, a longer prayer. Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. So you realize that she knows that Christ is the Messiah. She's coming by true faith. She understands who he is. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But now she just says, Lord, help me. And yet there's everything in this prayer. It's a three-word prayer that connects heaven and earth. When you cry that prayer out today, you reach up into the heavens, you cry out for the Lord. You reach down into the hellish mess of your own heart and your own sin and your own filth and your own need. Me and help is that linking, that linking verb that connects God and me. It's, it's that word of mediation. In fact, God uses that word help of Jesus himself. Thou hast laid help upon one who is mighty. John Bunyan tells us in Pilgrim's Progress that when Christian fell into the slough of despond, he, there was a man who reached down and helped him out, pulled him out. His name was Help. And Bunyan says in the margin, Help is Jesus. 
Help is Jesus. And so this woman is saying, I cannot let thee go, Lord. I cannot, I cannot not have thee. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Her prayer is reduced. And God often does this. Have you ever noticed how often Jesus in the Gospels, when a parent brings a child to him, he deals with the parent's soul first, either saving them or maturing them, until the point where the child is temporarily forgotten. And the Lord has a way of doing that. Also in your troubles and trials in life, he sanctifies them by sanctifying you so that you forget certain things and you end up focusing, even the trial you might rise above it, and you end up focusing on your relationship with Christ. And you see that he's teaching you things through your trials. Lord, help me, you cry out. Help me. I need closer relationship with you. That's a wonderful prayer. A three-year-old can pray it. It's beautiful in its simplicity. It's beautiful in its profundity. It's saying, I can't help myself. It's saying that without thee, I can do nothing, Lord. I need you. I need you. I can settle for nothing less than you. That's how faith wrestles with God and gets matured. Doesn't mean this woman didn't care about her daughter now. But you see, now she's on the front burner. Now it's her relationship with Jesus. Jesus personalizes our sorrows, our needs, our trials in life to bring us face to face with him. So that's as if he's speaking to us all alone and we cry out, Lord, help me. Help me. And she does that by coming and worshiping. This is not a, just a cry for her daughter to be healed. She's worshiping him. She sees he's Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Here's another confirmation. Now the word worship here in Greek is pros kineo. It's actually two words. Pros means towards and kineo means to kiss, to kiss, to kiss towards. It's a word that means all the affections of the heart go out toward the object of worship, which is Jesus. That's what faith does. Faith isn't just a knowledge that savingly knows Jesus. And not even just a trust that savingly puts all its confidence in Jesus. But faith is also an assent, an agreement that he is Lord and I am nothing but a sinner. And it makes me move all my affections toward him. My desires, my hopes, my love, my childlike fear of his name, I, I, I worship him. When you worship God, you do it by faith. And faith is saving knowledge, saving assent, and saving trust. Faith involves the whole man, all your affections, your will, your mind, your soul. Faith surrenders everything to the Lord Jesus Christ as its sole object. That's what Jesus is doing here. You see, as he seems to reject this woman with one hand, he's drawing her secretly in the inner man with the other to come and to worship him and to say, Lord, help me. I cannot let thee go. It's this maturation of faith. But then there's a third. There's a third trial here. Jesus I seem to rebuff this woman and says, I've come only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She then worships him and he responds, but, the third but, it is not fitting to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. You say, what in the world is that? Well, just as people today might call someone a pig out of an insult, in those days, the Jews called Gentiles sometimes dogs. It was an insult. And why in the world would Jesus use an insult in addressing this poor, needy woman? It's not easy to explain that. But you need to understand that in those days, there was a difference between dogs and dogs. 
In Old Testament times, all dogs were wild. Nobody had a pet dog. I mean, today everybody has a pet dog. On the floor in the hotel I'm staying in right now, I've met three people in the hallway and they all had dogs with them. It's amazing. Dogs are everywhere. They're on airplanes. They're everywhere today. But in that day, only in the New Testament times were people beginning to have very little dogs as pets. And those dogs would eat the crumbs that would, the leftovers that would fall from the family's table. And so Jesus actually uses, in the Greek language, he actually uses that term called little dogs. The New King James Version translates it little dogs. Jesus is saying that it's not fitting to take the children's bread, that's the, the, the Jewish people who, for whom he came to be prophet, and to give it to the Gentile, but then he goes, little dogs. And the woman picks up on that right away and says, well, Lord Jesus, I'm willing to be one of your little dogs because I'm not asking to sit with the Jewish brothers and sisters around the table. I know I don't have the rights. I, I know I'm a Canaanitish, I'm a Syrophoenician, and I don't have the religious rights. I don't have the natural rights. I don't have the citizenship rights. But Lord, you're, you're on the boundary. You're on the boundary of Israel. Can't you let a few crumbs slip off the edge of the table to this Gentile dog? I'm happy to be your dog. It's like she's sticking her beggar's foot in the door and saying, I'm happy to belong to you, even if it's at, a, at the dog level. I just need you. I can't do without you. So she takes what seems to be a real insult and she turns it into, a, into an argument, a holy argument with the Lord. She engages in holy argumentation with Jesus. Like Job did when he said, oh, that I knew where I might find him, I would fill my mouth with arguments and order my cause before him. This is not a rebellious, fist-like argument, but this is a, is a humble argument, a pleading argument. I cannot do without thee because my need is so great. This is how God matures our faith. You see, this woman knew she was a sinner. But she had not yet confessed to Jesus that she was a filthy sinner, that she was like a, like a dog, a beast before him, as, as Heman called himself. But the Lord, you see, is leading her further. So she's emptied, emptied, emptied of all her own righteousness. And she comes to him just poorer and poorer and more and more needy in herself. But she gives a master answer. Martin Luther says of her answer, this is a master stroke that ensnared Christ in his own word. He who loves to be so ensnared by poor sinners. She takes him in his word. She hears that little word, little. You know, and there are many languages today, not English, unfortunately, but many languages today, like the Dutch language from which my, my background is. You add the J-E, you add a J-E, to a word, and it's, it means little. So a dog is hunt, and a little dog is huncha. That in Greek has something a bit similar, you see. And so she picks him up at that word, and she says, ah, I've got him now. Little dog. I want to be a little dog. Yes, yes. I'll be glad to be his little dog. I'll be glad to receive the crumbs. That's all I ask for. You know, the Puritans spoke a lot about holy argumentation with God in prayer, holy wrestling with God in prayer, taking him at his word. They said, you take the promises of the Bible and you present them back to God and you plead on them. You take the Psalms and you turn a petition around and you plead on it. Say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You start thinking about the Lord as shepherd, for example, and you turn it around and say, Lord, be that kind of shepherd to me. And, and you plead with him. You turn the promise inside out, they said. And you retort the promise back on God. And you say, Lord, do as thou hast said. That's the way to wrestle with God. To not let him go. To say with Jacob, I will, I will plead. I will not let thee go except you bless me. This woman here is the New Testament wrestling Jacob. 
New Testament wrestling Jacob. She turns the promise into a petition. And you see, God is tender of his own handwriting. He loves to see his own word in front of him. The best way to pray actually often is just to use the words of the Bible and pray them right back to God and say, Lord, do as thou hast said. In my study, I've got, behind my study chair, I've got about 10 prayer books of forefathers. And when I get a little discouraged with my own prayers or just feel a little down about something, I often just reach back and pull out one of those books, the prayers of Spurgeon, prayers of Bickersteth, prayers of Matthew Henry, and, and I just start reading it's a picker-upper for me because their prayers are so beautiful. But what I notice in all of those books is that most of their prayers are just Scripture, coming back to God, taking Him at His Word, holding Him to His Word. And God loves that. You know, Isaiah 64, God complains. I think it's verse 7. God complains, no one takes hold of me. In another major prophet, he says, Command ye me concerning the works of my hands. See if I will not do it for you. Bring great petitions to a great king, says John Newton. Lay hold of God if you want mature faith. Plead his promises. Bring his word back to him. Say, Lord, do as thou hast said. Now, I said that's like, that's like sticking your foot, a beggar's foot, in the door, so the door cannot be closed. And my dad, my dad used to tell us this wonderful story. When he was nine years old, my, my grandparents were very, very poor. They had just like uh, two little rooms to live in and then a little bathroom. Their house was about the size of maybe some of our garages today. And, uh, but there was a train track behind their house and uh, beggars would often get off the train as, if it would stop and they'd come to the front door and, asked for something, and my dad said, when he was nine years old, one day a, a beggar came, and my dad answered the door, and the beggar said, uh, can you make me a sandwich? So my dad went to my grandma and asked, asked him, asked her, and she said, you go tell the beggar we're just as poor as he is. So my dad went to the door and said, we're, we're, I'm sorry, but he said, we're just as poor as you are. And so my dad went to shut the door, but the beggar stuck his foot in the door and, and, and wouldn't let the door go shut. And he, and he looks down at my dad and he goes, just one slice of bread. So my dad doesn't know what to do, so he goes back to my grandma and he says, the beggar won't go away. He wants just one slice of bread. And my grandma says, oh, he's a real beggar, make him a whole sandwich. And you see, that's the way God often deals with us. John Bunyan made a list of his top 10 sins, his top 10 secret sins. And near the top of the list was, I often knock once at the throne of grace and I walk away. I don't wait for an answer. I don't wrestle with God. Have you ever had that at your home, that a salesman came to the door for something, rang the doorbell and took you a little while to get there and by the time you got there, he, he, he was already half gone, half across your lawn, over to the neighbor. And you said, oh, well, must be a salesman. I won't bother him. You see, a real beggar, a real beggar won't go away. A real beggar keeps knocking. A real beggar comes and worships him and says, Lord, help me. A real beggar takes his word and wrestles with that word and says, Lord, do as thou hast said. This is the way we grow in grace. If you've got a six-month-old baby brother or sister, or niece or nephew, that little baby cries and gets his way, her way, right away. Because it's an infant. But at your age, you go to your parents, do they always give you everything you ask for right away? No, sometimes you have to wait. You learn in life, you have to wait. You learn in spiritual life that God matures you through waiting. You learn in spiritual life that in waiting times, you often learn more than in possessing times. Because through waiting, there's a weaning process. You get weaned of the things of this life, and you get ripened for the life to come. If God gave you everything you wanted in this life, 
You'd put your tent stakes too deep in the soil of this earth and you wouldn't be hankering for the life to come. If you're a true Christian, you see, ultimately, yes, you're pilgrims here. And yes, there's things you look forward to, but you're just pilgrims traveling through Vanity Fair and you're on your way to the celestial city. John Calvin said, he who does not hanker, hanker after the city to come, whose building and foundation and maker is God, has made little progress in the Christian life. You want to be a mature Christian. You don't want to be a four or a five with one foot in the world and one foot with, in, in, in Christianity. You want Christ to be your all in all. You want to be able to say with Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Don't put your life in this world. See it as Vanity Fair, as it is. Yes, be salt in the earth. Yes, be light on the hill. Yes, be Christ-like in this world. Yes, have a mission in this world to live wholly and solely for Christ. But don't put your heart in this world. Don't be of the world, but be in the world, traveling to a never-ending eternity. You see, our problem often is we, we give up on God too quickly. We stop praying. God matures our faith when he keeps us on praying ground, when he keeps our foot in the beggar's door. And then he comes. He actually comes. He really does fulfill his, his, his poor, needy beggar's cries at his time, in his way. Bishop Joseph Hall said, God either gives me what I asked for, or he gives me what I should have been asking for in the first place, which is actually better. But even, even while you're waiting, you see, just to have an open throne of grace, just to have an, the ear of God to hear your cry is already a blessing. One old Puritan, William Bridge, put it this way, "'Tis a mercy to pray, though I don't receive the mercy prayed for." Just, just to have the ear of God, just to have communion with the living God of the universe is a glorious blessing. And so this woman here, what she does is she wonderfully passes all three tests that Jesus gives her. She doesn't go home with the silence, the apparent silence. She doesn't go home with the apparent rejection. She doesn't go home with the apparent insult. She keeps having him, having him, as it were, in her, in her arms of faith. And she says, I cannot let thee go. Lord, let me be a dog. Let me be a dog at thy table. And when she passes this third test, then Jesus says, and this is the point of the whole story, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. That's beautiful, isn't it? Thy faith. Thy faith. He worked that faith in her, but he calls it thine, hers. You see, when God gives us something, it becomes ours. He gives it away to us. And we owe everything to him. Also, our faith to him. It's, it's not always easy to understand, but it, it's beautiful. How can it be God's faith worked in us and our faith at the same time? Well, let me try this. When our kids were younger, then when it was maybe a week before my birthday, my wife would come to me and say, um, the children would like to give you a birthday present. So I reach for my wallet and I give my wife $10, $20 for each child and they're gonna go out and get me a present. So the money goes from my wallet to my wife, to the children, they come back with a present and what do I say when I open the present? Thank you so much. This is beautiful. This is wonderful. I don't say, well, why did you spend some of your own money? No, because it's my child. I love to receive back what I have given to my own child. And what God loves to do is he loves to pour into you if you're a true Christian, and then you give it back to him. And he praises you for it, and he calls it your faith. That's how it works, spiritually. But God doesn't only confirm that it's her faith, he actually 
gives her full assurance when he says, this is thy faith. This is true. He validates her. He validates her as a, as a true spiritual child of Abraham, though she's a Gentile. Old woman, mature is thy faith. And then he pours out his, his bounty. It's as if he takes the keys out of his pocket and gives them to her and says, you can go into the storehouse of my grace. You can have anything you want. I trust that you will take all those things that glorify me. Take what you will. Be it unto you even as you will. And she goes into the storehouse. I'm speaking figuratively, of course. And she gets two big loaves of bread, as it were. And she carries them home, one for herself and one for her daughter. And her daughter is made whole from that very hour. Jesus does answer prayer wonderfully. And the word whole there in Greek is a well-rounded wholeness. Her daughter's made whole physically, and no doubt she's made whole somehow spiritually. And the mother begins to talk with the daughter right away about this special Jesus. And they have sweet communion, no doubt. This is who Jesus is. He gives abundantly above all that we can ask or think. So are you praying and you think you're praying in vain? You're not praying in vain. He's maturing you. He's emptying you through his silence, through what seems to be rejection or maybe even insult. He's maturing you to lean wholly and solely upon him. Now, one more question before I close. How is it possible, though, that this woman, being an unworthy Gentile, a Canaanitish woman, the people of Canaan had, in the Old Testament, been cursed by God. How could, how could she be worthy of receiving all this, this incredible answer from Jesus? Well, she wasn't worthy. Well, how, how could she receive it though? Well, it's all of grace. Because you notice when I gave out my points at the beginning of this chapel, I said apparent silence, apparent rejection, apparent insult. Jesus heard her, he just didn't answer. Jesus didn't really reject her because he had a heart of love for her. Jesus didn't really mean to insult her because... He meant to answer her. Well, how is that possible, though? When she's so unworthy, like you and me. Well, it's because Jesus went through the real deal. Jesus faced the real silence. The silence of his own father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Dead silence. You see, Jesus pushed the woman away with one hand, seemingly, but he was drawing her secretly with the other. But God the Father, as it were, pushed away his son with both hands so that he could be the one to bear the silence that we deserve to bear forever in hell, the silence of a favorable God. And Jesus, Jesus bore the true rejection. He was slapped, he was spat upon, he was mocked, he was crowned with thorns. He was rejected on all sides by, by the elders in their holy robes of office. He was rejected, it seemed, by heaven, by earth, by hell. And he hung naked between the heavens and the earth. Even nature, even the sun would not shine upon him, seemed to reject him. Rejected, he, he endured the real rejection so that you might never be truly rejected of God. He endured the real silence that you might never endure the real silence of God in everlasting darkness. And he endured the real insult. He was called Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. No one was insulted like Jesus. But he was insulted so that he could take our place. He was rejected so he could take our place. He was silent so that he could take, he faced silence so that he could take our place. We deserve everlasting silence, everlasting rejection, everlasting insult. But Jesus took it for us so that he never, never is really silent to his people. He never rejects his people. 
He never really insults his people. It's only apparent. He uses apparent silence, apparent rejection, apparent insult to mature our faith so that we grow in communion with him. And in union by faith, we cry out, Lord, increase my faith. Grow me, mature me, ripen me for glory. And that ripening, that maturation, dear students, is even more important than how you do in your classroom. That is the ultimate classroom. Am I growing through my studies? Am I growing in my life in the Lord Jesus Christ? Lord, help me mature my faith. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank Thee so much, so very much, for Thy maturation process in Thy people. Whether it's young people, children, older people, You know how to mature our faith. And I do pray, Lord, that Thou wouldst mature every believer's faith in this audience today. Keep us from sin. Make us haters of sin, lovers of Christ, pursuers of holiness, empty us of our own righteousness and fill us with thy own and mature our faith on every hand. And do be with those in our midst, Lord, who don't know thee savingly, for whom this whole chapel is kind of like a mystery. They they don't know anything about wrestling with thee. Lord, show them what they're missing. Make them jealous. Show them their need. Show them their sin. Convict them. Convert them. Draw them that they would run after thee mature their newfound faith. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.